Well, this morning we're, um, we're continuing our series called The Truth Is. And this morning is uh, World Communion Sunday, and so in this day we're going to, to talk about uh, the sacraments. We're going to talk uh, primarily about communion. And as we think uh, about communion it, as being uh, remembering, remembering uh, what Jesus did on, on the cross, remembering you know, through communion is what we're going to be doing in, in this day. You know, in the United Methodist Church, we have two sacraments. Uh, those two sacraments are, are baptism and the sacrament of Holy Communion. Now, both of these sacraments are things that Jesus instituted. When it came to, uh, com- when it came to baptism, you know, he, he told Nicodemus that he needed to be born of, of water and the Spirit, you know, talking about baptism being a, an outward response to what God had, had already done in, in his heart. You know, when it comes to communion, Jesus told us that, uh, that we are to, uh, whenever we break the, the bread and drink from the cup, we are to do so in remembrance of him. Now, there are some churches that recognize more than, than two sacraments. For example, there are some churches that recognize foot washing as a sacrament. Now, foot washing may be something that we participate in from time to time, but we don't recognize it as a sacrament, but it is um, something that, you know, in, in the right setting is meaningful and God can, can use in our lives. There are other uh, churches that recognize uh, marriage or, or ordination of as, um, as sacraments. And again, we don't recognize them as sacraments, but we do recognize them as, as sacred acts that, that God is involved in. So there are differences between churches as to what we recognize as, as sacraments, but I, I believe that the two most common sacraments recognized are baptism and communion. But there are, are some uh, denominations, for example, the, the Quakers that don't uh, don't recognize or don't practice communion or baptism, but they see it as something that inwardly happens in their heart and not something that they, they participate in a, as a congregation. You know, when we, when we practice a sacrament, there are three individuals or, or entities that, that are involved in that process. God is involved, the church is involved, and an individual is involved. You know, as God is involved in a sacrament, God brings uh, validity. God is, as God is involved in, in a sacrament, uh, his grace flows in that, in that moment, in that process. It, it's a mystery. I don't understand it all, and yet God is involved in the sacrament. You know, in the case of, Jesus, of communion, Jesus instructed us, do this in remembrance of me. Sometimes a communion is called a, a holy mystery. You know, we don't understand it all. We don't understand exactly how God is involved. We, we can't manipulate or, or cause God to be involved in a certain way. But, but as we participate in the sacrament of, of holy communion, God is present. God is involved in the holy mystery. God, uh, God's grace flows in, in that moment. The, the, the sacrament of Holy Communion is referred to by, by some different names. So if you hear it being referred to by different names, realize that it's, it's talking a, about the, the same thing. It's talking about breaking the bread and, and drinking from, from the cup. You know, probably one of the most common references is the Lord's Supper, referring to that last supper that Jesus had with his disciples in, in the upper room. You know, sometimes it, it's referred to, at least in the book of Acts, the New Testament church uh, referred to it as, uh, as breaking of bread. It may be referred to as, as Holy Communion, which invites us to, ho- to focus on the, the self-giving acts of, of the Holy God. And then sometimes it's referred to as, as Eucharist. Uh, the word Eucharist is, is a Greek word that, that means thanksgiving, reminding us that that we participate in the, the act of being thankful for God, for, for his creation, being thankful for God, to God for, for sending his son in, into the world, you know, for, the, for the act of salvation. You know, Catholics refer to, um, to it as, as mass, which comes from the Latin word that means sending forth. 
You know, these are all referring to the, to the same act instituted by Jesus at the Last Supper. You know, God is involved in, in a sacrament. And secondly, the church is involved. Now, the church brings regularity. The church brings order to how it is that we, that we do the, the sacraments. Now, as I talk about different ways of, of doing sacraments, I, I'm not passing any judgment on, on other denominations, but even as I, as I prepared this sermon, I, I recognize that, that uh, different denominations, different churches have different ways, regularity, order that they bring to, to the sacrament. And, um, and a lot of those, that order, a lot of that regularity comes from the, the church's history or, or, or preference. Uh, even though we're guided by Scripture, I realize that a, a number of the things that we do are, are guided by, by our tradition. Well, when it comes to um, the regularity of, of um, the sacraments, first of all, in, in um, the United Methodist Church, sacraments are always presided over by an appointed pastor. You know, a, a pastor that has been authorized by, by the bishop to, to, to minister in, in the church on and um, on, on behalf of the denomination. And so even though I don't know any place in Scripture that you know, indicates that only uh, an ordained pastor can, uh, can administer the, the sacraments or administer Holy Communion, that is the practice in our denomination. And so as clergy uh, serving in the United Methodist Church, we've agreed to, to follow the, the practices, the, the guidelines that's given to us uh, by the denomination. And likewise, for the congregation uh, here at the Monticello United Methodist Church, we have, have agreed to, to live by the, the order in, in the United Methodist Church. So our practice when it comes to sacraments is that only ordained clergy will lead in the, the sacraments. I'm often asked, uh, well, why is it that we we only have communion or usually have communion on the first Sunday of the month? Well, the answer to that is tradition. You know, actually, in, in days gone by in the, the United Methodist Church or the, the Methodist Church that, that preceded, there were circuit riders. And a circuit rider often had uh, 13 communities that they served. They would, would go around to a, a different community every week. So the circuit rider would come around uh, every 13 weeks or, or once a quarter. And in that process, uh, whenever the, the circuit rider came to town, the circuit rider would serve the, the church communion. And so there was a tradition uh, for many years, and, and some churches still continue this, that they have communion once a quarter. And that's because um, even though there's not circuit riders anymore, but it's out of that tradition of the circuit rider coming once a quarter. You know, th then as, as um, the circuit riders you know, kind of slowly diminished and were giving, given single point charges, then congregations began having, uh, having communion more often as they had an ordained pastor all the time. And a, a lot of churches practice communion, uh, at least in the, the United Methodist tradition, you know, normally once a month. And, you know, there are also some congregations that will, will offer some sort of a communion or Eucharist service, you know, every Sunday morning. Maybe not during the, the main worship service, but it, it would be something that, that they offer to, uh, to those that, that want to, to participate. Now, there are other denominations that, um, that have communion every week. You know, in, in the in the context of, of their, their public worship, you know, following the, the guidelines that uh, you know, are, are prescribed by their denomination and, and seeking to, uh, to follow Jesus' command and inviting them or urging them to break bread every time that they, they meet to, together. You know, the church also gives order in how we receive communion. You know, we use bread and grape juice. We don't use pop and potato chips, but it's bread and grape juice are, are the regular way, is the order that the church has prescribed as we, as we uh, participate or have communion together. So as we do that, when it comes to bread, it can be unleavened bread, it can be leavened bread, you know, in order to um, those who have dietary uh, restrictions and, and can't have gluten, we, we have gluten-free bread. There's... Um, there's a bowl of gluten-free bread on, on the altar railing today. You know, wanting to 
wanting to give opportunity for, for all to, to come to the table and not want to, to create a stumbling block. You know, and it, it was actually a, out of a, a controversy in the church of, of not becoming a, a stumbling block to anyone. Well, it was the reason that the, the Methodists, now the United Methodists, went from using wine for communion to using grape juice. Back in the 1800s, the, the Methodists were very involved in, in the, the abolitionist movement in, in uh, seeking to um, you know, do away with alcohol because they saw the way it was, was um, ruining families and, and impacting commu- communities. And, and in that process, the, the church was against serving alcohol, but yet they were serving wine with communion. Well, part of that was, um, was out of necessity because there was, wasn't refrigeration. You know, it was an issue. They would squeeze the, the grapes, and, and then after a few days, it would ferment and, and turn into wine. Well, it was actually a, a controversy in the church that, um, you know, of not serving wine because they didn't want to be a stumbling block for someone. They didn't want someone who struggled with alcoholism for, for receiving communion in church to, to be the thing that would, would push them off the wagon. And actually, there was a, a dentist by the name of Dr. Welch who uh, decided that he was going to commit himself to finding a way to serve unfermented wine or, or unfermented grape juice in the, in the churches. <clears throat> and so Dr. Welch, who was a, was a dentist... Uh, figured out a, a way, you know, he learned about uh, Louis Pasteur and pasteurization process. He learned to pasteurize grape juice to keep it from fermenting into wine. And thus, Welch's grape juice w- was born, uh, was, was made by, by a United Methodist in, when it first was produced in, in the mid-1800s. Now, there's no official declaration in the United Methodist Church that we have to use Welch's grape juice, although... Um, it is probably one of the most popular grape juices that, that's used for, uh, for communion. When it comes to the church giving regularity to, to the partaking of, of uh, communion, the, the most popular methods would be intention, where we take a piece of bread and, and dip it in the grape juice, or to, to have the grape juice in a cup and, and to have a, a piece of bread and, and to partake the, the bread and the grape juice in that way. You know, God is involved in the sacrament. God brings validity, and God is involved. God's grace, you know, is, is at work in the midst of the, the communion, in the midst of the sacraments. It, it's a mystery how God is involved, but God is involved. The, the church brings regularity and order. The church gives direction of how it is that we participate in, in the sacraments. And the, the individual, as we participate in the sacraments, we bring effectiveness. We bring effectiveness as we come in faith. You know, it's possible for us to simply go through the, the motions and just re- receive communion and it means nothing to us, but, but it becomes effective as we come to the Lord's table in faith. You know, I want us to turn the, to this morning's scripture reading in, in Luke chapter 22. It says that um, as Jesus was with his disciples in in the upper room, when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Uh, Jesus is is eating the the Passover meal with his disciples. The disciples have come for a celebration. It's a meal that that the the Jews had been participating in for for nearly 2,000 years in in, uh, a very similar way each time as they remembered God's faithfulness to his people, remembered God's deliverance, remembered how God had been at work in their midst. There were certain pieces of food that were eaten at a certain time and, and in a certain way. There, were, there was a lot of tradition with, um, with the way the Passover meal was eaten. There were four glasses of wine. Two of them you know, were, were drank before the, the main meal. Two were drank after the main meal. Each of them symbolized something different. And for those who had participated in the Passover meal, uh, they knew exactly the, the significance of each of those um, those cups, and, and it was uh, described during the, the, the Passover meal as they participated. Well, the, the disciples had come to, to share in a Passover meal as a celebration. But for Jesus, this was not a normal Passover meal. This was not a normal celebration. 
he knew that he was going to give new meaning and new significance to the, the Passover meal. In verse 16, Jesus said, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Well, this would have been the second cup that he's talking about, and that second cup was the cup of deliverance, and it was drank before the, the main meal. And then it says he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. On the night of of the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, which was uh, unleavened bread, which was normally eaten during the, the Passover meal, but he gave it new meaning. He gave it new significance. He said, now whenever you break this bread, whenever you eat this bread, he said, do it in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. Jesus was instructing his disciples that whenever they broke bread, they, they were to remember him. You know, there are different understandings of what happens when, when the elements are, are, are blessed when we receive communion. You know, in the United Methodist Church, we, we believe that as we, we bless the elements, the, uh, the elements are, are symbols for us. Uh, they're symbols of Christ's broken body, and the, the grape juice is, is a symbol of, of his blood. You know, as we as we pray blessing over those elements, we don't believe that they are changed in any way, but they become for us symbols that remind us of, of Jesus' um, broken body and, and the blood that he, he shed for us. There are some who have an understanding that when the elements are, are blessed, um, there's something happened called transubstantiation, that, that somehow they are, are literally changed into to the body and blood of Jesus. Now, that's not our understanding, but yet God is still involved in that. God's grace is, is still involved as we participate in the sacrament. Verse 20, it says, In the same way after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the, the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table, the Son of Man who will go uh, as it has been decreed, but woe to the man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be that would do this. That cup after supper that they would drink from was called the, the cup of redemption. And in the Passover meal, whenever they came to the cup of redemption, they would always talk about the Messiah who was going to come, the Messiah who was going to redeem them, the, the Messiah who was going to, to change things. And on this night, as Jesus picked up the, the cup of, of redemption. Instead of talking about a Messiah who was going to come, he said to his disciples, I'm the one. I'm the Messiah. Whenever you drink from this cup, whenever you drink from this cup of redemption, don't think about a Messiah who is going to come at some point in the future, but drink from this cup recognizing that I am the one. I am the Messiah. I want to talk about one more thing real briefly and when it comes to the, the practice of, of communion. Uh, and that is, uh, who can receive communion? Well, in the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, which means that anyone who wishes to respond to the invitation is, is invited to come to the Lord's table. And that invitation is all who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and, and seek to live in love and charity with your neighbor, if that's the desire of your heart, you're invited to, to come to the Lord's table. You know, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he often participated in the sacrament of Holy Communion four or five times a week. You know, Wesley was also one that uh, you know, didn't judge others' hearts as they, they come to, came to communion, but if their hearts were so moved, if, if they desired to, uh, to come to, to the Lord's table, even if they didn't have it all together. If they were coming in faith, you know, Wesley believed that even in that communion, it, it had the, the, the potential of God's transforming grace in their hearts and lives. Now, there are some churches that practice closed communion, and that's their choice uh, of how they, they do that. You know, sometimes closed communion means only members of that congregation can partake, or it means... Um, only those who, who are a part of that, that denomination. And that's, 
their practices, that, that's their order with, within their denomination, and so they need to, to follow that. And whenever I'm in a, a church that practices closed communion, you know, I don't try and, and force my way in to see if they'll, they'll serve me. I, I respect the, the order, the guidelines that they use there. But in the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion, so anyone who wishes to respond is invited to, to the Lord's table. Another question is, what about children? Well, we don't have a, a formal process, a, a formal time, a formal age that children, children can begin receiving communion, but we normally leave that up to, to families and, and, and parents to, to decide. But uh, one of the things that we're going to, to be doing with the elementary age children in, in a couple weeks on, um, on October 15th, I'm going to, to meet with the, the elementary age children, and we're going to talk about communion and give them an opportunity to, to share in communion together. And we're going to seek to, to do that on, on a quarterly basis in their Adventures in Faith classes. So parents, you should be receiving notification of that. And if, if that's not something you desire, you know, we'll certainly re respect that. But want you to know, you know what we're going to be trying to do in, in training the children and, and helping them to, to participate in that uh, as well. Well, this morning as we share in this sacrament together, you know, we're, we're remembering, we're remembering Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection. You know, and as we participate in, in the sacrament, God is involved. You know, God will be involved through his grace. You know, the church is involved in, in giving order and, and regularity of how we do it. And as individuals, you bring effectiveness as you come in faith. You know, this morning would invite you to, to prepare your hearts as we prepare to come to the Lord's table.